right, wonderful. So I'm going to be giving uh, the talk, but it's a talk that's really co-authored by both uh, Louis Favela and, and, and myself. And uh, as it's customary to say, all the mistakes are mine, all the good ideas are, are, are Louis's. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but Louis will join us a bit later during the uh, discussion in response to, uh, to, to question. And but before, uh, presenting the talk, I wanted to uh, thank both uh, Marco and Fabrizio for um, this invitation. We are actually delighted to be joining back uh, uh, this series. And I'm also just, independently of this specific talk, I'm also very grateful for the work they've done for the philosophy of neuroscience community. And I hope every speaker just acknowledge uh, how much work they've been able to do and how much they've been able to contribute to the field. So thank you guys for everything you've done. Um, and it's really very genuine. All right, so uh, what I want to be talking about in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is uh, the concept of uh, representation in psychology, but also uh, uh, mostly in uh, uh, neuroscience. I think it's widely agreed both by uh, most philosophers of neuroscience, even so not by everyone, and also by most neuroscientists, even so again, not by everyone, that representations are um, uh, important in the field. Most psychologists, most cognitive scientists, most neuroscientists believe that a good theory of the mind and the brain is going to postulate representations of the organism's environment. I think it's a common it's a common assumption in cognitive science and neuroscience. Nonetheless, of course, many of you are familiar with the fact that there's been an intense debate on the question in, in, in philosophy, but also in the sciences themselves. And so the question we are going to be addressing in a somewhat new manner today is: should it be the case that uh, the concept of representation is so central to the philosophy of uh, neuroscience? As to, to, to psychology and to neuroscience. And what we will be arguing in uh, the next uh, few minutes is uh, uh, the uh, claim that the concept of representation as it is used in psychology and in neuroscience is actually unclear in the technical sense uh, that I will be explaining a bit later and uh, confused also in the technical sense that we'll be explaining later. And from that, we will be arguing that the concept of representation should be either substantially reformed or eliminated from the uh, sciences uh, themselves. So that's the goal of this lecture. It's what I hope to uh, uh, convince you of. I mean, I think a, a crucial take home, take home message is that um, uh, the static quo uh, about the, what representation Ah, what the, what the word representation means is unacceptable, and that scientists need to up their game, and philosophers of science, philosophers of neuroscience, need to help them improving uh, their their game to to be clearer and less confused about what it is they're talking about. All right, that's the goal of this lecture. This is the goal of the paper that Louis and I wrote. So I have three main things to do. So buckle up. I want to uh, say a few things about the role of the concept of representation in neuroscience. It's going to be the object of the first section. Then I will describe four different studies that we and I have conducted over the last three years that examine how neuroscientists and psychologists understand what representations are, try to get at their concept of representation. And from that, we will be concluding that neuroscientists and psychologists have a confused and unclear concept of representation, which will raise the question, well, if that's so, what are we going to do with that concept in the sciences? Right? So that's, that's the goal of, of this talk. All right, let's start with mainstream representationalism. Representationalism just is the idea that understanding cognition as well as the brain, developing cognitive theories or neuroscientific theories requires postulating representations as well as processes that are defined over these representations. Uh, representationalism is mainstream. I think it's widely accepted. I'll provide you uh, a little bit later with some evidence on uh, the uh, matter. Um, but it's not only is it widely accepted, it's accepted in such a way that there are specific methods as well as research programs which are dedicated to understand, to the extent that it's doable, 
the representation that um, um, uh, uh, people that the brain and the mind is actually uh, is actually for. So let me start with the claim that representationalism is widely uh, accepted. Here is just uh, a few quotations. I gave you four. I literally could have filled these lectures with quotations drawn from mainstream articles by leading neuroscientists. So I had only two of them. Uh, Paul Drack in a, a, a noticed paper recently published in Synthes. Uh, right, that the concept of representation is used broadly and uncontroversially throughout neuroscience, in contrast to its highly controversial status within the philosophy of mind and cognitive science. And Freund, it, Freund, Freund in a recent article in TICS uh, about the nature of control in neuroscience, write as follows Cognitive scientists and neuroscientists have devoted more than half a century of collective effort toward understanding how control arises in mind and brain. This understanding has typically been sought through the lens of two complementary cognitive constructs, representations, and processes. And they go on using these two concepts to theorize about the nature of control in, in the brain. And again, uh, uh, Kigus Gotter says the same thing. Shaman Hedelman in a famous paper also says the same thing. So that's, it's, it's widely accepted. Not only is it widely accepted, there are some important methods and that's that growing importance over the last uh, 20 years in neuroscience, whose main job is to try to understand what representations are, where they are located, how they work, what they represent. Um, and here I give you, and I'll say a few, a few more words about, about them in the coming slide, but I give you three examples. Adaptation fMRI on the left of your screen, MVPA in the middle of your screen, and um, um, uh, representational uh, similarity analysis in the right part of, of your screen. So let's start uh, with uh, the first one. Ephemeri adaptation was mostly developed in the late 1990s, uh, but was also influential in the, in the 2000s. Chris Spector was a leading uh, proponent of this method. So the basic concept is very simple. You show uh, uh, a, a given stimulus twice in a row. For example, you can, you can show a letter uh, twice. And the parts of the brain where you see adaptation, where you see a decrease in the ball signal, are taken to be the part of the brain where representations are located. And then you can identify which aspects of the stimuli get to be represented. Now, it was a very influential methodology. It was widely used uh, in the late 1990s and in the 2000s to study, for example, the location of letters in the temporal stream, the location of uh, a representation of quantities uh, um, uh, in the uh, temporal bilateral junction, the representation of faces, and also the representation of more traits, like BHUs, for example. Um, Another method that has actually grown in influence since the early 2000s and that remains extremely important is MVPA, multivoxel pattern analysis, where the idea here is to replace uh, a univariate analysis of the ball signal by multivariate analysis of the ball signal. Uh, um, and so either within a region of interest or throughout the, uh, the brain, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can do... Um, 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 uh, um, uh, multivariate analysis of uh, the change in, in the ball signal, and you can, you can, you can do the patterns of activation. One interpretation, not the only one, but an influential interpretation of the patterns of analysis is that of the patterns of activation is that those patterns are representations. And people like, like uh, James Haxley, I believe the last speaker of this, of this series, uh, which is uh, uh, really interesting. Uh, so has been, has been a, a proponent not only of, of MVPA, but also of the representational interpretation of, of MVPA. And he's been using that, for example, to look at the representations of artifacts in contrast, for example, to animals, as well as faces in, 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 in the brain. So here what we have is another methodology to identify not only the location, but the content of the representation. More uh, recently, yet another methodology has emerged, uh, ASA, representational similarity analysis, which is mostly, which has been mostly, but not, not exclusively, developed by uh, Krieger's Porter, where the idea here is to, is to use uh, the similarities between uh, patterns uh, between MVPA analysis, so the, um, uh, the, the network to look at the similarity and to project that back to create a similarity space for the stimuli. 
So the idea is that we can identify how the mind or the brain represents the stimuli by projecting from brain activation to the stimuli themselves. Right? So we can, in a sense, decipher the content of what the brain represents about the stimuli. So what these three methods have in common is that both of them are trying to make claim about representations in the brain. They differ with respect to their empirical assumptions, and their results are, of course, very different from one another. But it's not simply methods which are which aim in your sense at identifying representations in the brain. Some research programs have been uh, dedicated to understand the nature of representations. So one that I've been particularly concerned uh, uh, for the last 15 years of my uh, research is what I like to call neoclassism. It's the idea that uh, concepts of artifact are really perceptual representations or concepts of everything are really perceptual representations. And uh, what this, what this uh, research program does is making a claim about the nature of our conceptual representations. More recently, uh, Josh Green, in his recent research project, is looking about uh, the location of the language of thought in, in the brain. Uh, again, that's a specific commitment to understanding the nature of representations in, 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 in the brain. So, to summarize, what we have is um, uh, a part, and I think a large part of uh, neuroscience, accept representationalism, Specific methods are dedicated to understand uh, neural representations and research program aim at studying them. The problem, however, is that it isn't clear at all what psychologists and neuroscientists mean when they use the word representation. And because of that, it isn't clear at all what they are committed to when they accept representationalism. More important, maybe perhaps, it isn't committed, it isn't clear at all what the methods are supposed to be about. So MSA, MVPA, ephemeral adaptations are all supposed to decipher brain representations, neural representations. But what does that even mean uh, to decipher brain representations? We need to have a clear understanding of what representations are to be able to, to get to understand what these methods are supposed to be telling us. And we don't. And uh, it's also uh, an issue because we don't have Right, because the notion of representation is so unclear that we don't have criteria to assess when those research programs or when those methods are successful. Right? We don't we don't know when, as a matter of fact, for example, RSA has been successful in identifying representations because we don't have criteria about what would be required for being successful at identifying representation. And all these problems stem from. Uh, what we and I think is an unclarity in the concept of representation as used by psychologists and neuroscientists. So what we wanted to do is to try to, to uh, get dig a little bit deeper about in, in these uh, 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 worries, try to deepen them and try to really see, well, let's see exactly what neuroscientists have in mind when they use the notion of representation. Maybe that's going to give us a sense of how to understand their research project, their methods, their um, uh, research programs. And to do so, we used uh, what I call in my metaphilosophical work, in my book, Philosophy Within Its Proper, Proper Bounds, Naturalized Conceptual Analysis. So the idea is to study the concept of a group of individuals by using empirical and experimental uh, uh, methods. And so that's what I'm going to be telling you in uh, the next uh, 20 minutes or 25 uh, minute. All right. So what we've seen, I've described representationalism, I've described the use of specific methods, and I've described some, I've identified research programs that, that aim at studying neural representations. I've expressed concerns that until we have a good understanding of what representations mean for neuroscientists, these programs are uh, suffering from a lack of clarity that motivates the study of the concept of representation in neuroscience. All right. So let me just tell you about uh, the research, the empirical research uh, we and I have uh, done. So uh, we uh, decided to study how uh, various groups of uh, um, scientists use the concept of representation in an empirical manner. And so the first job was to try to get participants, try to get uh, scientists to get involved in our project. So we do it by recruiting uh, scientists from various disciplines. We send thousands of emails to a leading research institutions 
throughout the world, but for um, uh, uh, reasons I'm happy to come back to during the Q&A, mostly in the, US, in the US. And we also advertise on mailing lists uh, of uh, uh, leading research institutions, leading research societies, as well as on social media, Twitter, and so on. So on. Our goal at the beginning was to recruit participants from uh, many disciplines. So we had in mind to recruit linguists, to recruit um, uh, people who do uh, computer science and so on and so forth. But given how difficult it was to get scientists to take part to our study, we ended up focusing on three different groups for which our sample size was large enough. Neuroscientists on the one hand, psychologists on the, uh, on the, on the second hand, and philosophers on the third hand. So philosophers here being sort of a comparison sort of a comparison group. And what you can see here on the screen are some demographic information about these uh, three um, uh, about these three groups of participants. We, we had uh, uh, between 150 and 200 participants for each of these groups. Here is uh, was the structure of the experiment. Participants, when they logged in on the website, were asked some demographic questions. And then they were given four studies in randomized order. Right? Uh, so, so each participant was given uh, a distinct order. Studies one in, for, in study one to three, participants were randomly assigned to one of two conditions. Right? So for example, in study two, participants were assigned either to condition one or to condition two, and so and so forth for studies one to three. In study four, as you will see, there was only one condition, so there was no random assignment to condition. Then participants were asked some further general questions about the foundations of neuroscience. Now we barely talk about that uh, today. And then they were given an attention check to make sure that they were actually really paying attention to what we wanted them to pay attention to. Now, let me just tell you about the data analysis, the way the data were analyzed. We first excluded some data on the basis of pre registered. Uh, criteria. So we didn't introduce new criteria. We just applied the pre-registered criteria, and then study by study, we analyze the data by in a traditional manner by using ANOVA, using an R. We set the significance level at 0 0.005 in accordance to a Benjamin R recommendation. When we had significant effect, we used a post hoc t test, and we plotted the interaction. And then we did some a few exploratory analyses that were not pre-registered. Uh, uh, in light of our, of our results. Right. I mentioned earlier that um, uh, most people would agree that cognitive scientists and neuroscientists are committed to uh, representationalism. And here are some data to back up that claim. You know, I think data are barely needed, but I think here are some, some data nonetheless. One of the questions we ask neuroscientists is the following one and psychologists and philosophers, does cognition involve representation? Yes, no. And as you can see, an overwhelming majority of participants, both in neuroscience, that's the first pair of colon, in psychology, the second pair of colon, and in philosophy, the third pair of colon, and so yes, nearly 90% in this three discipline believe that cognition involves, in some sense, of course, representation. But what does it mean by cognition? Well, Let's start to look a bit at the concept of representation. As I said, we have four studies. Studies one to three had two conditions. Uh, so let's start with study one. The goal of study one was to understand uh, how uh, scientists um, and philosophers think about the vehicle of, of neural representations. More precisely, what we were interested in was whether scientists and philosophers make any assumptions about the scale of the brain at which representations are to be found. Are we supposed to find representations at the level of neurons or group of neurons or at the level of brain areas? It's a difference, it's a difference in scale. And what we want to know is whether neuroscientists and other scientists have any commitment with respect to the location, the scale at which representations are to be found. Uh, participants were assigned to one of two conditions randomly, uh, the neuron condition and the population condition. Let me describe to you first the population condition and pay attention to that slide because it's a basic structure of all the experiments we've run. So in all the experiments, participants show a short text 
and then some images. And we've tried to do to make the stimuli as realistic as uh, possible. And indeed, they are drawn from scientific papers. So, um, in that condition, participants read the following text. In a study published about 10 years ago, participants were presented with visual stimuli in a standard block design with alternating images of human faces, house, and cars. Figure A. Figure A describes uh, the sequence of stimuli. Data were obtained for participants' physiform face area via uh, blood oxygen level dependent imaging, bold contrast imaging, with a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner with high spatial resolution box sets, figure B. Figure B, you have um, uh, uh, the change in the bold signal in uh, the FFA. And uh, an example of the time series data obtained during the task is presented in figure C. So that was actually not a, uh, I think, I don't think that was a realistic, um, I don't think that was drawn from a paper. But what you see is that. When participants see a face, you've got change in activation. When participants see a house, no change in activation. When participants see a car, no change in activation. See a face, change in activation. All right. That's the stimulus. All right. Now, the, the dependent variable, the question. We ask people to assess on a scale from one to seven, <coughs> seven statements. The neural population spiking carries information about faces. So here's the, the target carries information. So neural population processes faces. So neural population identify faces. So neural population spiking is about faces. So neural population respond to faces. So neural population spiking represents faces. All right. So we we had these uh, six possible questions on a scale from one to seven. Note that one means agree, seven means disagree. All right. So I hope that the population condition. The so neuron condition is very similar, except the stimuli are changed. Instead of recording with fMRI, we record from uh, multi-electrode arrays. So we change, uh, uh, we change the, uh, the images, right? So what we have here is two different scales at which the vehicle of representations could be located. And what we wanted to know is that do neuroscientists make any distinction or and other scientists make any distinction between these two scales? Do they expect representations to be measured at the level of the neuron or at the level of, of the population? And what you can see here uh, are, are the results. As you can see, it's a complex pattern of results. So let me walk you this graph because we'll see similar graphs in, in all, for all the studies. So the roles are the discipline, neuroscientists, philosophers, psychologists, all right? The columns are the question represents information about response processes identified, all right? Each panel represents the two conditions, the neuron condition in red and the population condition in green. All right, so what is uh, not worth seeing here? Well, there are three, there are quite a few things that are worth noticing, but for the purpose of this talk and given the time, I want to, to draw your attention to three main things. The first one is um, um, the manipulation, neuron versus population made no, had no impact as whatsoever on participants' response. So they just, they just don't distinguish between the two conditions. As you can see, if you look at each panel, the mean, which is uh, the, the, gray, the gray bar here, uh, is the same for each of the two, uh, for, for, for each uh, of the two uh, violin plots in each of the panels. Right. So participants did not really have any expectation at the scale at which the representations were to be found. First observation. The second observation is the type of questions that were used made a difference. So participants were more willing to agree with some questions compared to the others. And the way to see that is to compare, for example, response to represent. The mean for represents is at four. So neither agreed or neither agreed. The mean for response is about two. Yeah, agree. So, and what you can see here, if you look at the sixth question, you can actually see a pattern emerging. All of participants are ambivalent about using intentional description to characterize the reaction of the brain. Representation is about identifying. All of them have an intentional nature. And, and for these three questions, 
the answer is around four, which means ambivalence. By contrast, for questions that have a causal nature, response and process, or an information theoretic nature, information, <laughs> participants are much more willing to describe the brain's reaction to the stimuli, to the stimuli in causal and uh, information theoretic terms. One way to think about that is intentional characterization of the brain response. Man, I don't know. Causal characterization of the brain response. Yeah. All right, that's a second, uh, uh, it's a second observation. So third observation is that uh, for intentional characterization, the, the, the mean is, is around four, right? So it's not that people, re it's not that neuroscientists reject a, represent a representational characterization of the brain, is that they are actually ambivalent. They just don't really know what to say. All right. To summarize, there's a bit more to be said. I'm happy to come back to Q&A, but moving, that's a key point. Uh, what we observe is an ambivalence in the use of intentional concepts. In contrast to causal and information ways of characterizing the brain's reaction to stimuli, we also found that neuroscientists and psychologists are non-committal about the vehicles of representation. And we find very, few, very little differences among, uh, among uh, disciplines. Let's move to study two. So study one, as I said, was about the vehicle of representation. Study two, sorry, is about the relation between the stimulus and the change in the brain. And what we manipulated was sensitivity, namely the probability that a stimulus of a given time appears conditional on, on the activation, right? And we contrasted two different conditions, high sensitivity and low sensitivity. In the high sensitivity, uh, uh, whenever you have um, uh, the probability of having a stimulus of a given time, of a given type, for example, a house, if you have activations, the FFF is one. If the low sensitivity, by contrast, this probability is lower. Okay? So, and see what we wanted to, to get at is scientists, in particular neuroscientists' expectation about the relation between the mind and the brain, sorry, between the world and the brain, such that we can use representational terms to characterize this relation. <laughs> Here are the high sensitivity, here are the low sensitivity, same type of structure as we've seen earlier. What varies, to see what varies, please go to the image called C on each of the, of the stimuli for the two conditions. As you can see on, on C for the high sensitivity, there's a reaction for FEST, no reaction, no, there's a change in the ball signal for, for the FEST stimuli, no change in the ball signal for the house and car stimuli. Change for phase, no change for house, no change for car. So high sensitivity, actually perfect sensitivity. By contrast, for phase uh, uh, in the low sensitive condition, the, uh, 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 the FFA reacts both to phases and to houses, but not to car. Right? So, the, so the reaction to phases is act, the uh, sensitivity to phases is actually uh, lower in, in, in that case. So we wanted to know whether it's manipulating the sensitivity, the causal, the nature of the causal relation between the stimuli and um, and, and the build activation matters for the use of in, uh, the concept of representation and related concepts in neuroscience and psychology. That was the goal of, of that study. Does it? Um, well, it's, it's a slightly complicated pattern of, 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 of response. So let me uh, walk you uh, through, uh, uh, through this uh, pattern of, of result. So first observation we had made earlier, a contrast between the types of question, intentional question, may, I don't know, puzzle, uh, information theoretic question, yeah, is confirmed by this analysis. We find the same pattern here. As you can see, respond, uh, 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 the mean is around two, um, uh, represents the mean is, is four and above. All right, so we find uh, uh, we find the same type of results. People, scientists are willing to use causal information theoretic notion to describe the brain's reaction, much less slow for intentional notion. They're, they're ambivalent. We find again the same ambivalence. Now, with respect to the question of sensitivity, when you aggregate across the uh, three uh, groups of participants, neuroscientists, philosophers, and psychologists, what you find is an effect of uh, sensitivity. 
So uh, the three groups are more willing to uh, answer positively across the six question uh, when um, when sensitivity is high compared to when sensitivity is is low. And you can see that by comparing, for example, here about uh, for neuroscientists uh, with a higher mean for the low sensitivity, so more disagreement than for the uh, a high sensitivity in blue, uh, less more agreement. And, and you can see that in many of the panels you see uh, you see here. However, when you look at representation itself, so that the first column on the left of your screen, the column of representation, what you see. Oh, wonderful, I can actually use that. So if, if you look at this color here, the color of representation, what you see here is that it's only for the psychologist that uh, uh, sensitivity happens to be, to be maturing. For neuroscientists, there's a trend, but there's no significant, there's no significant effect, mostly because of the, uh, uh, the size of the variance here in the answer. So it's only among psychologists that sensitivity clearly matters for the assignment of representational status to um, um, uh, uh, the reactions of the brain. On the other hand, as, as we saw earlier, that does not move neuroscientists to what, as psychologists or neuroscientists to what saying that, yeah, it's okay, you can describe some brain's reaction in representational terms, because in all these studies, the mean is above four, which means it is either ambivalent or in the side of disagreeing. What's the upshot? Well, we confirm our previous results uh, in terms of ambivalence with respect to intentional notion and willingness to use causal and information theoretic notion. We found that across all the questions, discipline sensitivity appears to matter, but it appears to matter in a complicated manner. When we focus on representation itself, so the first of the questions we looked at, so there is no evidence that it matters for neuroscientists, even so there might be a trend, what it does for psychologists. Now, that was a second study. Let's move now to the third study, the role of the concept of function and representation. That study was, uh, I should probably rush a little bit, Marco, right? I've got about 10 minutes. Yeah. Actually, you got even uh, 15. Okay, 15 is good. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so the study was inspired by, of course, the discussion in philosophy of mind, arguing that the concept of function is essential to assign representational status to uh, brain events and to uh, um, um, biological events more, more, more broadly. Um, and so we wanted to know whether neuroscientists are sensitive to uh, functional considerations in the use of the concept of representations and the use of related concepts. Again, participants were assigned to one of two conditions. One was there is just a correlation between a neural event and, a, and the presence of a stimulus. And one where, in addition to this correlation, there is a, a change in the, there is some information provided about the function of this neural event in the broader architecture of the brain. Here are the two conditions, the sense structure, and we should be familiar with that. The mere correlation condition is just the one we saw earlier. So you, it's a standard fMRI study. The so correlation plus function, we give information about the relation between change in the um, um, uh, uh, FFA and the presence of a face, but we also uh, give them some information about how this information happened to be used by the rest of the brain, both verbal information in the, in the, in the stimulus, uh, in the text that we, that we give, and also visual information that just connects, for example, change in the FFA with further changes in, 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 in the brain, right? So we was, the idea was to show that what's happening in the FFA is part of a broader network uh, uh, in, in, in the brain. And we wanted to know whether this information about the use of um, 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 uh, change in the bold signal in one area by the rest of the brain was actually influencing the use of the concept of representation. And here are uh, the uh, results. Um, again, what you can see is the same pattern, willingness to use causal and um, information theoretic ways of describing the brain. Responding is good. Uh, processing is good. Information is good. 
ambivalent when it comes from for, to the use of representational characterization of the Gwen's reaction. Represent is about identifies the means are around form. <laughs> The second observation that you should you should uh, make is that the manipulation had literally zero effect whatsoever. Uh, neuroscientists uh, and psychologists are literally indifferent to the use of functional information when it comes to use any of this uh, notion um, uh, to describe the brain's reaction. Whether or not a brain event is used does not influence its description in representational terms, nor in causal terms, nor in information theoretic terms. What's the upshot? Uh, 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 it function matters only for a few ways, I should say, of describing the brain's reaction to stimuli. Overall, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter at all for the concept of representation. All right. There was a third study. The fourth study is uh, about misrepresentation. And again, here we were inspired by uh, philosophy, by the idea that there is no representation without misrepresentation. And we wanted to know whether neuroscientists are sensitive to this idea. They are willing to describe brain events as, in some way, mispro misrepresentation, misidentifying, and so on and so forth. So we give them the following uh, study. It's, again, the same type of design. Uh, but to see the point, look at C. What you can see is that there's a changeable signal for face in the first block, not for house, second block, not for house, third block, change to the, to the ball signal for face, that's the fourth block, and surprisingly, a change to the block signal for three, for five, for house. All right, that's what you should be seeing here. All right, so change for face, no change for house, no change for, for car, change for face. Good. Oh, change for house. Change, no change for car, change, change for face, good. No change for house, no change for car, change for face. No change for house, no change for car. So the question here is, how will neuroscientists describe the changeable signal there? Are they willing to think of that change in the ball signal as a mistake, as a misrepresentation, as a misfunction, misfire? And we ask the following question, misrepresentation, so spiking of neural carries information about the face. So when we have the really wide react to houses, does it carry information about the face? Is it about the face? You know, we see something about the face uh, while it's caused by a house, uh, as misresponded to a house, misprocessed a house, misidentify a house as a face. And uh, what you see here is that uh, in all of these cases, the ends, particularly for neuroscientists and to some extent for psychologists, but very clearly for neuroscientists, is that the mean went to the side of disagreeing. Right? So, so neuroscientists were unwilling to uh, characterize the reaction of the brain as a mistake, independently of the type of question we use, misrepresentation, information about net misresponding, misprocessing, misidentifying. If you look at representations, the DVTV were not willing to say that for this block five, the brain's reaction misrepresents the house as a face. And the same is true here for the psychologists. Philosophers are interestingly slightly more willing to, uh, uh, to, to, to say that, but it's not also only at four, which is uh, the uh, uh, neutral point. What well, the outcome is that, uh, maybe to our surprise, neuroscientists are reluctant to describe the brain as failing to do what it is supposed to do. And they're particularly unwilling to assign misrepresentations. All right. So when we focus on four questions, the scale at which the vehicle of representation is going to be found, the nature of the causal relation or, or information theoretic relation between a change of the brain and a stimulus, the role of sensitivity, Third, the role of function in assigning representational status and other notion. Fourth, understanding misrepresentation. And the outcome is that no assumptions about the scale. Sensitivity matters for some question for psychologists. It does not appear to matter for neuroscientists. Function does not appear to matter. And uh, 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 both neuroscientists and, and psychologists are unwilling to think of the brain as failing to do, and in particular, to think of the, of the brain as misrepresenting. 
what is supposed to represent. From, what, from, from these findings, we want to conclude that the concept is both unclear and confused in a technical sense. A concept is unclear when you don't know what follows from applying that concept and when you don't know when you're going to apply that concept. So you take a concept, the concept of chair, and you say, oh, that's a chair, but you don't know what follows from the fact that it's a chair. And you don't know when to apply this concept. You don't know what follow from what follow from what. That's what it means to have an unclear concept. And I think what we've, what we've seen is that scientists have an unclear concept of representation. They don't know the level at which the brain structure, they don't know at which level of aggregation representations are to be found in the brain. They don't know whether representation must have a Cummings function. Uh, then it doesn't matter, at least for neuroscientists, it does for psychologists, but it doesn't matter for neuroscientists uh, uh, whether sensitivity is, is perfect or is lower. And in all of the studies, they're always uncertain about the use, ambivalent about the use of the concept of representation. So just think they don't really know when to apply this concept at all. I think it just shows that the functional role of the concept of representation is extremely unspecified uh, in um, uh, on your sense. That's what it means to say the concept isn't clear. It's also a confused concept. A concept is confused if it fails to distinguish two things that are actually different. And uh, the study four that we've presented earlier <coughs> showed that the concept of representation is actually a confused concept. It fails to distinguish natural signs for which there can be misrepresentation and representation for which there must be, for which representation must be possible. So with what we have here is a Moncrel concept. It's a concept that fails to distinguish um, natural signs from genuine uh, representations. So I think the upshot here is that new scientists have a concept of representation that unclear. They don't really know what follows from using that concept of representation. They don't really know what's required for, for, for using that concept. And a concept that's also confused, that fails to distinguish things that must be distinguished. Now, what to do with unclear and confused concept in science? Well, one position that um, uh, is not extremely well known in philosophy of neuroscience and is no, no, but not very well known in uh, philosophy of science is a work from uh, Hans Jörg Reinberger, sorry, uh, who is a historian of science at the uh, Max Planck, an important historian of science at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. And Reinberger's work is in part focused on the epistemology of unclear and confused concepts, or imprecise concepts, as he likes to call them more broadly. And the idea is, why do so many sciences have unclear, <coughs> sorry, have unclear and confused concepts? And, 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 and the basic idea is that, in fact, lack of clarity, uh, confusion, lack of precision is actually functional uh, in, in science. And that philosophers of science have been mistaken is in striving for clear and uh, precise uh, concept. So it's a position that defends the statu quo. Against the statu quo, one can suggest that when one, one finds an unclear and confused concept, one should reform it. For example, one can explicate that concept along Canap's line. And finally, one can suggest, again, to bring someone who talked uh, in these serious early years this year, Pat Churchland, one can just eliminate that concept. One can look. It's a concept that's hopeless. Let's get rid of that uh, concept. Let me say a few words about each of them. So static quo first. Um, and the basic idea here is that unclear and confused concepts, more broadly imprecise concepts, have a function to play. They're actually functional appearances to the contrary, notwithstanding. The, the problem here, however, is that uh, the kind of circumstances that Heinberger have been focusing on to justify the use of imprecise concepts don't really apply to the present case. So uh, Reinberger has focused mostly on the concept of gene, and I think the concept of gene is actually <coughs> polysemous, and as a result, uh, in fact, quite, quite unclear. And, but it takes a, a lack of clarity and the polysemy to be a virtue of this concept because it allows the transfer of information, experimental paradigm, findings, from one field to the other. It's an interfield concept, as uh, philosophers of science calls this concept. And the vagueness or lack of clarity 
or imprecision of the concept plays a role in inter interfield pollination. However, the same cannot be said for the concept of representation. I think there's literally zero reason to believe that the concept of representation has played and is playing uh, a role of pollinating across fields of the cognitive sciences and the brain and the brain sciences. Uh, I think the situation is extremely different here from what's going on in genetics. And furthermore, the costs should not be uh, forgotten. Uh, uh, it breeds unresolvable controversies. Um, and I didn't mention that, but neo empiricism which I mentioned earlier, is a place where, because of a lack of clarity of what is required for something to count as a concept or as a representation of something, there is a debate among people uh, doing neuroimaging about whether the evidence shows that concepts are perceptual or not. And what we have also is a lack of robustness of methods. The three methods I mentioned earlier, and BPA, RSA, and adaptation ephemerized, are not robust. They don't find, they don't provide convergent evidence about the location of representations. And we can't res resolve the, the, the disagreement between these methods until we have a more precise concept. So I think we should move beyond the statu quo. And I think we and I agree and insist that we should move beyond the statu quo and turn to what changes. Uh, we mentioned that two possible changes, reform or eliminate. And uh, at least for now, at least for this project, we are actually neutral with respect to these two options. Uh, we believe that one of them must be pursued and must be pursued with uh, a very serious commitment, but we don't know yet which of those uh, is the right way to go. And I think there are things to be said for both uh, and against both. Reform first. Well, one worry with reform is that uh, philosophers of uh, uh, mind and cognitive science have written extensively for now more than 30 years on the notion of representation. The fact is, and I think our studies show, uh, that it has had pretty much zero impact on neuroscience. Uh, the practicing neuroscientist has not taken on any of the ideas that have been debated in um, uh, the philosophy. The fact that misrepresentation is not willing, the concept of misrepresentation is not willing to be, that neuroscientists are not willing to use the concept of misrepresentation is actually quite telling. And I think there's, in fact, very little appetite among scientists to clarify the notion of representation. They're very happy to go along with a place and with a place or order that see we need quite empty. So reform is attractive in many ways, as many philosophers would want to go there, but they are concerned about whether it's going to work. Elimination uh, itself is, a, uh, you know, it's it's uh, a possible position that has a long history in the philosophy. In, of science um, and uh, uh, in some sciences uh, too. However, uh, at this point, it's not entirely clear what a non-representational cognitive neuroscience would be uh, looking like. It's not like we don't have any alternative. We have, we've got dynamic approaches to uh, both cognitive science and uh, neuroscience. But whether or not these approaches are in a position to really uh, uh, help neuroscientists reframe much of their research, I think, is um, uh, up for grabs. And it's not, not all neuroscientists would be uh, uh, willing to go there. So, what we have is these two options. It's not quite clear where to go. Both have um, 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 downsides. However, what we want to be insisting is that the statu quo is unacceptable. Uh, the use of the concept of representation, given how unclear we should need to be. And given how confused we've shown it to be, uh, without making an effort to uh, either clarify it, meaning reform it, um, or uh, maybe even to uh, uh, think about ways to go beyond the representational neuroscience. Um, um, uh, uh, I think that statu quo, in fact, is uh, unacceptable and untenable. All right, I would like to, to uh, thank again my uh, co-author, Louis, who is uh, with us right now. We will be joining us for the uh, uh, Q&A. And uh, thank you for your attention.